What's up everybody? In this video dealing with function analysis, we're going to talk about the rate of change in quadratic functions. So let's explore the average rate of change over consecutive equal length intervals for quadratic functions. So again, the key thing here is consecutive equal length intervals in a quadratic function. So they got to be consecutive, so they got to be going in order, and they have to be the same length. So it doesn't matter the length, you pick the length, right? So it could be 5, so we can negative 5 to 0, that could be the first interval. And then the next one would be 0 to 5, and the next one would be 5 to 10, and the next one would be 10 to 15. So that would be an example of um, consecutive. I mean, they're going consecutively in order. There's no gaps in between them. One ends at zero, the next one starts at zero. One ends at five, the next one starts at five. And they also have to be equal length, okay? So we're going to do this by first looking at a graph, and then we're going to examine a function to kind of see what happens when we're looking at the rate of change over these consecutive equal length intervals. So first here is my um, beautiful quadratic function in red here, and we're going to find the rate of change in each of these intervals, the average rate of change over each interval. So we're going to look from negative 2 to 0, 0 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 6, 68. So here they are consecutive. Every time an interval ends, the next one begins, and they're all equal length. They're all length of 2. So we can actually see them down here. So we're going from negative 2 to 0, that interval, then 0 to 2, then 2 to 4, then 4 to 6, then 6 to 8. So we're looking at those intervals there. All right, so the next graph here is me actually plugging those secant lines in. So you can actually see the, the blue, the green, the brown, the purple, and the, and the turquoise secant lines that actually show the average rate of change between each of these intervals and I took the time to actually go ahead and do that just to try to save you the time but hopefully by now you guys know the process my goodness if you've gotten this far you should know the process to find the average rate change you simply subtract the y's on top subtract the x on the bottom from point to point so anyway here are the rates of change from negative 2 to 0 we have negative 1.6 from 0 to 2 negative 0.8. From 2 to 4, it's actually a flat line. You can actually see that brown line right there. There's no rate of change, rate of change of 0. Then from 4 to 6, we're at 0.8, and then from 6 to 8, we're at 1.6. So what we want to do here is say, all right, well, what do you notice? What, what do you notice about these rates of change? So I notice a couple things that should all make sense to you. So first, I notice that they are increasing. Right? Uh, it started off as a negative 1.6, and then, and then it increased to negative 0.8, and then increased to 0, then it increased to 0.8, then it increased to 1.6. So as I looked at these equal length consecutive intervals, the rate of change increased. You can actually see it in the lines here. So first it was pretty negative, then it was still negative, but not so much. Then it flattened out at 0, and then it got more and more positive. So that means we are concave up. So that's one thing that we can identify here when we look at this. Um, we learned that concave up is when your um, rates of change increase over that interval. So since we see that here, we can literally see it. We can also see that we're concave up. Hopefully that all makes sense. All right, we also noticed that um, as we went through the interval 2 to 4, we, we, were, we were negative on the left side, and then we were positive, and then in between we were 0. So that means that somewhere in that interval from 2 to 4, somewhere down in this interval, we switch from a negative rate of change to a positive rate of change. And we know that when a switch is made from a negative to a positive rate of change, that there must be an extrema. And look, you could see the extrema, the, the, the min there, in this graph. So it's another thing that we notice. Now, one more really cool thing that we notice is that the rates of change are not only increasing, but they're increasing by the same value. So they're, they increase by 0.8, then they increase by another 0.8, then they increase by another 0.8, then they increase by another 0.8. So I could assuming that if I would go to the next equal length consecutive interval from 8 to 10, that I would increase by another 0.8. And that would be a very safe assumption. So that would be 2.4. That'd be another 0.8 increase. So remember, we learned that with linear functions, the rate of change is, it's, it's, it never changes. It's, the difference between any consecutive rates of change is zero because it's always the same. But a quadratic function, the difference of your rates of change are constant, meaning that they're a constant value. The rate of change constantly increases by the same value. With linear functions, the rate of change 
don't change at all. So there is no difference between them. It, that's, there's no difference. Whereas in a quadratic function, there is a difference in consecutive equal length intervals, rates of change, and that difference is the same number. It's a constant increase. So that's something pretty cool that we notice here. It's not always going to be 0.8. It just so happens to be 0.8 for this function, but it's always, whatever the, the, the change is, it's going to be the same. That's pretty cool. All right, let's do the exact same thing, but this time no graph. We're just looking at a function uh, f of x equals negative 3x squared minus x plus 4. Here we're going to look at consecutive equal length intervals of length 3. So negative 7 to negative 4, that's a length of 3. Pick up right where we left off, negative 4 to negative 1, negative 1 to 2, 2 to 5. So every one of these intervals is first off consecutive and that they are all equal length 3. doesn't matter what the length is. Last one was 2, this one was 3. Just got to be consecutive and all equal. All right, so I actually took the liberty to go ahead and do this for you. I don't want to bore you with actually walking through because you should know how to find rate of change between an interval right now. But in this first interval, we have negative 4 to negative 40. Uh, well, that's terrible writing there, sorry. The point is... Let me start all over again here. Negative 7, the y value is negative 136. And at negative 4, the y value is negative 40. And if you take the time to find the average rate of change between those two points, you get an average rate of change. We'll call that an ROC of 32. Then from negative 4 to negative 1, at negative 4, the point is once again negative 40. And at negative 1, the point is at 2. And the rate of change between those two points is 14. From negative 1 to 2, so let's see here. At negative 1, the point is at 2. And at 2, the point is at uh, negative 10. Again, I, please, I'm just plugging it in. I'm just trying to speed it up. You could use your calculator if you want to check. But the ROC, the rate of change, is negative 4. And then from 2 to 5, so at 2, I'm at negative 10. At 5, if you plug it into the function, you get negative 76. The rate of change between those two points is negative 22. So once again, what do we notice? Well, we first notice that the rate of change is decreasing. The rate of change is decreasing. 32, 14, negative 4, negative 2. So if your rate of change is decreasing as you move throughout the function, that's the definition of concave down. So this is going to be a parabola opening down. It's going to be concave down. But hey, we knew this was a parabola opening down because of that negative leading coefficient. But that's proves through the definition that we are concave down because the rate of change is decreasing. But the other thing that's really important to notice is that the rate of change decreases by the same number. It goes down 18. How, do you like that that color there? It's like a psychedelic there. Uh, 14 minus 4, so that's going to go down 18. Down 18. So we notice that the rate of change is decreasing. Yes, that's what makes it concave down, but it's decreasing by the same value. So it's decreasing by a constant. That's pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. So we could assume that the next equal length interval, which would go from 5 to 8, would have, let's see, all I got to do is take negative 22 and subtract 18. The rate of change for that one, without me even doing the math, the rate of change would be negative 40. So that's going to be down another 18. So here's what we know. What we notice is that over equal length consecutive intervals, the average rate of change changes at a constant rate. This means that the rate of change of the rates is linear. So when you are constantly going down by the same value, down 18, down 18, down 18, down 18, you have a constant rate of change, and a constant rate of change means it's linear. So the rate of change within a quadratic function is linear. What's the rate of change within a linear function? It's, it's absent. It's zero. There is no change of the rates of change in a linear function. It's always the same. But in a quadratic function, we notice that there is a change in your rates of change, and that change is, in fact, constant, which means it's linear. So for consecutive equal length input value intervals, the average rate of change of a quadratic function can be given by a linear function. That's pretty cool, right? So what is the rate of change of the rate of change? Negative 18. Pretty cool. Go back to this example. What is the rate of change of our rates of change? Positive 0.8. And that's a feature, that's a characteristic of quadratic functions. Whatever the um, rate of change is, the rate of change is changing, that, that is for a fact, and the rate of change is changing by a constant value. 
In this problem, it's positive 0.8. In this problem, it was negative 18. So when you change by a constant value, you are linear. So the, cha the, the quadratic is not linear. Oh my gosh, it's a quadratic. So the, the output values of the quadratic is a quadratic, right? It does what a quadratic does. But the rates of change for consecutive equal length intervals are changing by a constant value, which makes that change linear. A little confusing, so I'm trying to explain it a couple different ways as I can, but I think that's a pretty cool feature that you will notice in any quadratic function. So you're either going to be concave up or concave down, depending if your rates of change are going up or going down, and whatever those rates of change are, they're going to increase or decrease by a constant value. All right, that is it for examining the rate of change of quadratic functions. Hopefully it was pretty short and pretty simple, but it's one of those videos you might have to watch a couple times to fully comprehend.